Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special bird banding program with Smithsonian's National Zoo and Migratory Bird Center for World Migratory Bird Day. My name is Kaden. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs, and I'll be your host for the day. I'm so excited for today's program and for you to meet our guest scientist and his feathery friends very soon. While we wait for more friends to join, we're going to start with a poll. I would love to know what do you enjoy most about birds? Now, if you're joining us on Facebook Live, um, feel free to just type it in the chat. Or if you want to join us with our polls, there's also a link for you to join us on Zoom if you would like to do that so you can participate in polling that way. So your choices are they come in so many different shapes, sizes, colors, watching them dive and catch fish, listening to their songs and calls. I love that they can fly or finding their nests. We've got lots of answers coming in and while they come in, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our program today uh, while you answer. So this program is live captioned. So if you are interested in live captioning, find the CC button on the bottom of your screen on Zoom, uh, if you'd like to turn that on. Or there's a wheel on Facebook where you can choose it for that as well. We also have ASL interpretation. You will see it live on Facebook Live. If you would like it right now, head over to Facebook Live to see our ASL interpreter. Or here on Zoom, we will have it uh, re in the recording for you later on when we post that. And we've got our Facebook link. We'll put that in the chat too, if you want to share it with everyone or hop and watch there. But I like watching on Zoom the best. Our program will be about 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes of questions. Um, this is a live program with live animals, so you never know what will happen, but that is our goal. Um, we have two migratory bird experts joining us as well. So we would love for you to ask them questions and they're gonna help answer them. So there is a Q&A button throughout the program. If you would like to ask any questions, feel free. Um, there's also a chat button where you can uh, chat with us as well. Our chat experts are named Mary and Amy, and they are two of our migratory bird scientists here at the zoo. And there we go. There's a picture of them so you can see what they look like behind the scenes. We have a big team joining us as well, helping with questions, posting videos and pictures. Uh, so there's a lot of us joining you today. I'm so glad you could all join us. So remember, you've got the Q&A, you've got the polls we're going to be doing. So feel free to interact with us as much as possible. Keep in mind that this is a live program, so anything could happen. Uh, we have thunderstorms moving through the area, so it should be fine at this point, but you just never know. Um, so just we're going to stay flexible and see what happens. All right. Lastly, while we wait for these polls to finish up, looks like we have a few answers. Let me in the poll and let's share that. So what you enjoy most about birds, that they come in so many different shapes, sizes, and colors, definitely one, but they're all great reasons. And I agree, birds are so diverse. So they are really, really cool to look at. Some swim um, and some can't fly and some fly all around. That's great. Okay. And now I would love to hear more from you. So find the chat button on your screen and I would love to know where you are from and if you have a favorite bird what is your favorite bird or how are you going to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day so let's see oh yeah so excited I agree I see people like the colors hello Allison Gabriel Isaiah Asher Oh, so many people joining us. Layla, hello back. Oh, Gerard likes bluebirds, yes. Sahib likes eagles, oh, me too. Those are really, really big and fun to see. Jane in Arlington loves hummingbirds. Cora and Frederick loves the blue heron. Those are great to see. Allison's in Florida and loves red birds. Yes, just like that picture that Amy was holding of that ibis, it's nice and red. And cardinals are great too. Aaliyah's from 
Brooklyn. Oh, I love this answer, Amanda. Amanda's from Alexandria, Virginia, and her favorite bird is whichever one they are looking at. Yes, I love that. Hello, Mrs. Carter's class in New York. Hummingbirds and penguins. Oh, these are great. Thank you all for joining us. These are all so wonderful. Oh, someone said puffins. I also love puffins. Great, thank you so much for joining everyone. Okay, so we're gonna do more polls throughout. Remember, we've got the Q&A, so ask questions anytime. Our experts will help answer them, and we can also ask some to Brian later. So let's dive in. Again, I'm Kaden Borseth, Learning Program Specialist at Smithsonian's National Zoo, and today we have an exciting program with Dr. Brian Evans. Brian is a scientist with Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. He studies birds that migrate or travel to different areas during different seasons. We have a lot of birds traveling throughout or migrating right now, so it's a great time for this program. Today, he's gonna show us a process he uses to study these migratory birds called bird banding. First, we're gonna start with a toy bird so we can learn about it uh, a little bit safer and more comfortable with our toy bird. And then we're gonna check out some real birds. So let's go to Brian. Brian is waiting in his backyard. Hello, Brian, thanks for joining us. Hi, Caden, hello everyone, welcome to my backyard. Yeah, we're so happy we're here and that it's not raining anymore. So that is great. Now, thanks for having us. And we're all really excited. There's so many really excited people in the chat and asking questions already. And we are looking to know from you, why is it important to study these birds that travel or these migratory birds? Well, studying migratory birds is really super important. And that's because we know that many populations of wild birds around the world are actually in a really serious decline. In fact, we know that just in North America, just since 1970, we've lost over 3 billion birds. And a lot of these birds are migratory birds. The migratory birds are really especially hard hit. So our goal at the Migratory Bird Center is to act like a team of scientific detectives. And together we're trying to solve the mystery of what's happening to birds around the world. So we can help uh, keep off their decline, help, help them away from decline. That's great. Yeah, Carlene heard when she said that they were declining, she heard that she says, why? Um, so definitely we were gonna, we're gonna get out into that throughout the program. We'll figure out why they're declining and how we can help um, to help save them. So that's great. So we're here to learn about bird banding because that's how you study them. So what is bird banding? So bird banding is a way that we can track birds over time because what's causing this decline is really a big mystery. We know some things, but there's so much more to learn. So we're out to try to solve that mystery. And we use bird banding. We attach bands to the legs of birds so we can see how individuals fare over time, how they respond to their environment, maybe how long they survive or where they move in their lifetime. That's great. And here on the screen, we have pictures of some of these bands just so we can see them up close because they are very small so they can fit on birds legs. There are some aluminum bands that have different number combinations on them and then some colored bands. Yeah. And Brian has that toy bird right there that has some bands on it already. Yeah. So how do you catch the birds and can anyone do it? Yeah, not everyone can catch a bird. And you have to go through a lot of training because we need to ensure that birds are as safe as possible. And we also need to ensure that whenever we catch a bird, we do it just for research. So every bird we catch is a part of this research project to determine how birds are doing. And we catch them in nets like these. This is called a mist net. You can see this net right now, but when I open it, we can't really see it well anymore. That's why we call it a mist net, sort of just like a light mist. And the birds can fly along and land into the mist net. And the mist net is divided into a series of panels and each panel has a pocket. And I'm gonna simulate it with my toy bird here. So the bird lands in the mist net and it hangs in this pocket safely until a skilled researcher who's a trained bander can come along and remove the bird from the net, carefully 
removing the net from the feet. These are metal feet, um, which can be a little difficult to take out of the net. Yeah, a little more okay. difficult than real bird. Removing the net, and here we go. And now the bird is safely out of the net. After we remove the bird, we take out a bird bag. And this bird bag is made of breathable cotton. And I'm gonna place our bird, who I will call Geraldine. Geraldine is a hummingbird. And we're gonna place Geraldine into a bird bag where it's cool and dark and safe. I'm gonna tie a knot around the bird bag. And then I bring her back to the banding station. She just hangs here safely until I do. Awesome, yeah. So that's a great safe place until you're ready to put the bands on and, and learn more about the bird. That's Absolutely. great, awesome. Um, and then we can't see the mist net at all right now, and we don't want to catch birds, right? So oh, yeah. we've already caught them. So we're going to put that mist net away. Uh, and while Brian is doing that, he'll work his way over to the banding table. We have a picture that will pop up of different tools that Brian's going to be using. So we saw the bands to put them on, but we also have some other things. So while Brian has each bird, we're going to learn about some different things he looks for the bird's health. Um, so we've got a scale to get some weight on these birds. We have aluminum bands, like we pointed out in the first picture, as well as colored bands. And to, in order to put those on, he uses a couple different tools. He's got pliers that he'll use, as well as spoons to put them on. So the birds don't get hurt. They're just put on uh, really nice and easy with those tools. And then the wing rule. And this is to measure the length of the wing. And we'll learn about why he takes these measurements as well. So when Brian's back at that table, we will learn about this with our toy bird. All right, Brian's back, great. So let's see, what is the first process you're gonna do when you catch a bird? Well, so welcome to the banding station. This is where all the action happens. The first process we do when we catch our bird is we take the weight. Caden, is this Geraldine? I can't remember. Yep, that's what you said. It is Geraldine. Okay, so we're gonna put Geraldine times. That's okay. on our scale. And we're gonna look at the weight with the bird in the bag. So the weight of the bird in the bag of Geraldine is 42 grams. Okay. How much is a gram? A gram, well, five grams weighs as much as one nickel. Oh, okay. So yeah, we all know what a nickel is. That's, I could, that's pretty lightweight. Yeah. Yeah. So let me take a look at that again. So 43 grams is the weight of Geraldine in the bag. Now I'm gonna carefully open the bag And I reach in and I'm just making sure that I, I'm gonna put her, put Geraldine in a bander's grip. I will show you what that means in a second. Just safely gripping the bird. And I slowly remove the bag from the bird and there's Geraldine. So bander's grip means I have a finger on each side of Geraldine's head and I'm resting my fingers softly on her shoulders and then I make a little bird cage with the rest of my fingers. I'm not squeezing Geraldine at all. It doesn't, it doesn't harm her. It's just holding her safe and still. So I weighed Geraldine in the bag. That was 43 grams. And now I weigh the bag itself. It's 27 grams. So if we take the bird in the bag, 43 minus 27, the weight of the bag, how much does Geraldine weigh? 43 minus 27, that's a great question. I don't know if it's in our polls, but let's see. We're gonna launch a weight poll. Let's even get close. What is the closest answer you think? We had 43 and 17. So 43 minus 17, what do you think it is? Who's got the closest weight? We don't really have one that's super close. We kind of have one that's in between. Good, I see a lot of answers coming in. 
Good. So we've got some saying around 18, around 34, and it's right in between everyone. That's great. It's around 26 grams, right, Ryan? Wow, 26 grams. Very cool. So Geraldine is 26 grams, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. When I hold a bird or band a bird for the first time, I sort of like to look at it. And there's lots of indicators, and we're going to see this with a real bird in a moment. But if I look at the shape of Geraldine's bill, the shape of her bill may actually tell me a lot about what she eats. Her size tells me a lot about what she eats. And size is something that we can measure for each bird. And we're going to take some measurements of the size of Geraldine. So the first measurement I'm going to take of Geraldine is the size or length of her wing. And this is like going to a doctor's office. When you go to a doctor, they might determine how tall you are. Well, I don't really know how tall Geraldine is and that's hard to measure, but the size of the wing is sort of an indication of how big her wing bones are. And when I measure a bird's wing, what I'm actually measuring is the length between the bend of the bird's wrist and the tips of its feathers. So from the wrist to the feathers, because most of the structure of the wing is actually, uh, sorry, the, the shoulder and the upper arm is actually sort of hidden for these birds. Yeah, so we've you got can, the slide up so you can see it a little bit better. Yeah, absolutely. That slide is great. So that really shows where that hand is actually extending. And most of the wing that we see, the feathers of the wing is actually coming from the wrist and coming from uh, the uh, fingers. It's the feathers that come down that we normally see with a, with a bird's wing. Yeah. So we can take a measurement with our wing ruler. And Brian, That's I just it. want to point out, well, this picture's up to everyone. Those colors with the human bone, so think about our arm and the different bones we have in it, those colors, when they correspond to that bird below, it's those same bones. So you mentioned the birds have a wrist. It's never something that I actually think about. But those blue bones, it's right there on that wing. So pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Kim. Yeah. That's great. So I'm able to hook. Our wing rule has got this little bend on it. And I'm able to hook that bend on the wrist and look at where it lines up on the feathers. And I see that Geraldine's wing is about 65 millimeters long. And we almost always take our measurements in things like millimeters and grams because it's the metric system, which is a great system of, of measurement that we use in science. So 65 millimeters is the length of Geraldine's wing. All right. So Geraldine also already has bands on it. So this means, remember, a band is a way that we can track a bird over time. And these bands means that we've actually caught Geraldine here before in our yard. So I see it has an aluminum band and that aluminum band has a number on it. It's a number like the license plate of a car. And that band is just, that number is, is just Geraldine's number and no other bird in the whole world. And we can use that number if the bird is caught again, we use that number to determine exactly that this is Geraldine and no other bird than Geraldine. Kind Geraldine. Like humans with social security numbers, huh? We yeah, each like social numbers. security numbers. Do too when they're banded. Exactly. So we also see Geraldine has color bands on her legs. So these are little plastic rings that Geraldine is wearing. We attach color bands so we don't have to catch the bird again to be able to identify Geraldine. So I can just see Geraldine flying around my yard and see, okay, it's got red on this side and orange on that side and another red. And that color combination can be used to identify her just like the band number is. And we read a color combination going from the left leg to the right leg. So I see Geraldine on her right leg has orange on top, meaning it's closest to her body and red on the bottom means it's, it's closest to her toes, so orange and red. What is on her left leg? Let's see if you guys can read Geraldine's left leg. Let me hold it right up for you. 
Okay. What is on the left leg? And I just launched a poll, so you'll see that popping up in a second. Awesome. I think it's thinking about it anyway. But what colors do we see? I definitely see some aluminum. I don't know, Shelly, maybe you can try launch it. There we go, finally popped up. Okay, so what color combination is on that left side? Is it aluminum on top, blue on the bottom, red on top? Remember, top is closest to the bird, and aluminum on the bottom. Aluminum on top, orange on the bottom. Yeah, that's a great view, Brian. And yellow on top, or an aluminum on bottom. Oh, everyone is getting it. You are all doing great. It is red on top, aluminum on bottom. That's great. Good job, everybody. Awesome. I should, I should hire you all on as my team of ornithologists to help me solve the mystery of what's happening to birds. Awesome. All right. So, uh, sorry. Well, I was about to say, we're about halfway through the program already. It's going so fast. Should we look at some real birds? Sure. Let me just release Geraldine into the yard. She'll, she can fly through and explore. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I have a question with those bird bands. So we're going to put them on real birds. Do they hurt the birds at all? No, they don't. They're very, very light and they slide nice and easily up on the foot of the bird. So it's, it's sort of uh, like wearing a bracelet. Wearing a bracelet doesn't hurt. Um, yeah, or a watch. Yeah, absolutely. Good, okay. Brian is gonna grab a real bird that he caught in the mist net right before the program started. And I am launching a poll for us to guess what bird do we think he caught? So there's lots of options here. Pick your favorite, pick one you might see in your yard. Which one are we hoping to see? We've got Cardinal, House Wren, Blue Jay, Catbird, Flamingo. I sure hope it's a Flamingo. White-throated Sparrow, Chickadee, Warbler, or Bald Eagle. I remember, yeah, Allison says, probably not an eagle. That would be something to catch in the nest net. Probably not a Flamingo either, right? Those are very big and not quite Flamingos aren't around here anyway, except for at the zoo. Good. Oh, so many guesses. Okay, let's end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. All right, and I'm gonna share the results so you can all see. It looks like people are hoping for a cardinal, maybe a blue jay, but a little bit of everything. So I think we will be happy with anything that you caught. So let's check it out. Hey, so let's find it. So. Remember, this is a wild bird that lives in my yard at least part of the year. And that might be a hint about this bird. So first I weigh the bird, the bird in the bag, and the weight of the bird in the bag is 29 grams. Now I'm gonna pass the bird off to my assistant who's going to be removing it from the bag for me. All right, so 29 grams for both. So we're going to start doing, thinking our math in our head. And now the weight of the bag itself is 17 grams. Hmm, how much does this bird weigh? Okay, so 29 minus 17. What is the closest guess that we have on there? Oh, yes. People are getting it. So 29 minus 17 is 12. So a lot of people are guessing 11 grams. Awesome. Almost everyone guessed that. They got it. All right, let's check out this bird. Wow. So 12 grams, just to get a sense of this, is less than the weight of three nickels. That means that this bird is specially adapted for flight. It has very, very light bones. It doesn't have teeth like we have teeth. This bird can really fly because it's so light. And this bird, we're going to take a look at it real quick. It's got this nice long bill. This is beautiful sort of grayish brown feathers and a beautiful dark brown eye. It's a very, very, very small bird. We can look underneath and see uh, the little speckling on its tail, little stripes, brown stripes on its tail. Yeah. This bird is a house wren. 
And house wrens are really cool because they're a migratory bird. And what that means is a migratory species is a species that lives somewhere part of the year, goes somewhere else another part of the year, and then moves back. This bird breeds right here in my backyard, actually in my neighbor's yard, and it moves down to Florida and Georgia and other parts of Southeast, the Southeastern United States and then moves back up here every single year to breed again. So it spends its winters down south and it spends its summers up here in DC. It sounds like great... my dad. Yeah, exactly. It's my mom too, <laughs> yeah. for sure. So just like the last bird, we're going to take some measurements. But first, we see that this bird is actually already banded. So this means that we've caught this bird in the yard in the past. Let's see if we can see, figure out who this bird is. So we have a blue band and a blue band on its left leg and an aluminum band over a black band on its right leg. So blue, blue on left, aluminum over black on right. And we can read the, the combination of numbers, which I have to look at very, very closely. Yeah, they're very small. They're very small, which is why we put the color bands on. Do you ever use a magnifying glass to try and see them? I sometimes do. I sometimes do. Increasingly, I need a magnifying glass <laughs> to see them as I, as I grow older. Yep. So yeah, 28401238 is the number that this bird carries. And it weighed 12 grams. So now I'm ready to take some measurements of the bird. And I have to sort of spin it around here in my hand. Yeah, and while he does that, he's making sure it doesn't get away. You can check out on his clipboard, he is keeping track of the weights and all the measurements that we're gonna do. And that way he can input it into a computer system and be able to have it, especially for the next time the bird is found. Yeah. So I'm ready to take the wing measurement. I just lightly place the wing on there around the shoulder. And I see that the wing is 49 millimeters long. 49 millimeters long is the length of the wing. I can take a measurement of the tail feathers. That's 42 millimeters long. Now I'll just look at the bird for a moment. I might want to figure out whether it's a male or a female. And actually, I can't tell whether it's a male or female bird yet. So I'm going to say unknown, whether it's a male or female. And I'm going to take a look at the bird's fat. And fat is a really cool measurement, a hard one to take. And Erica, I think, and has a I've picture done, you can show us of it instead. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. There's a picture of the bird's fat. So what I've done is I've blown this little a space around its feathers right here, which is a dent. If everybody out there can feel this little dent you have between your collarbones, that dent on a bird, if you've, if you've eaten a chicken or a turkey, that's the wishbone. It's called the furcular notch. The bone is called the furcula. Their collarbones are fused together, which is one of the adaptations that they have to help them fly. So that furcular notch, they store a lot of fat and we blow the feathers and we look at the skin and we see how much fat is there. And this bird is actually pretty fat, which is cool because fat is what migratory birds like this one use to migrate. They need that energy. It acts like a rechargeable battery. When they eat, they charge that re rechargeable battery up. And when they fly, they need to use that energy. They need to get that energy from somewhere. So they want as much fat as possible to be able to migrate around. Yeah, that makes sense. The last thing I'm going to feel on this bird or look at is I'm just going to rub its belly. And I'm really rubbing its chest right here. And I'm testing the breast muscles of the bird. In the middle of their chest, they have a bone that's called a keel. And a keel is a bone that sort of on a bird sticks out like this. It's the same as our breastbone. On us, it's flat. 
on a bird it's like this which allows their huge breast muscles to attach to that bone and that gives them an amazing power to fly i will that's never be able to fly, fly. Right? what's that and that's why we can't fly right yeah, that's why we can't fly. People will not be able to fly with their own arms, even if we had feathers, because we couldn't support them. Nope. So with this, I am now going to release our house wren back into the environment. We'll call, we'll call this house wren, um, I'll call it Harold for now, and we'll see, we'll see what they end up being over time. But we're going to release her into the environment. So I'm going to go behind the banning station and, and send Harold off into a bush to fly away and, and wander about my yard again. All right. And while Brian is walking over there, um, we are going to ask him once he does that, how long does he keep these birds um, that we caught today or that he catches ever? And why is it important? Like, why is it important that we found this bird again? So here's a video of a release. So you can see that the birds don't really mind being banded. They just think, what in the world just happened? Uh, they just have some new jewelry and then they fly away. And there they go. All right, bye. All right, we're gonna send Harold, just like that last bird, into the yard. So are you ready, Harold? All right, everyone Five, say bye, Harold. Four, three, two, one. Bye, Harold. There Harold goes. All right. Okay, so Brian, how long do you keep these uh, birds when you catch them? I know these ones we did not have very long. So how often do you, or how long do you keep them before you do something with them? Every bird is kept a maximum of one hour uh, from the time that they hit the net to when we release them. When we remove them, we store them in what's called a hospital box, which is a climate controlled environment. We put them in the hospital box. It's also very dark. It's nice. It's cool in there. And, and we usually have them in the hand for less than five minutes before we release it, as short a time as possible for every single bird. That's great. And then before we see our next bird or while you're getting it out, could you tell us uh, why is it important to study these? Like we had already caught that bird, but it's great to catch again, but why is that? Because if, we're, if we put together these capture and recapture histories or encounter and re-encounter histories of these birds, that information tells us how long the bird will live. So since we caught Harold last year in our yard, we know that Harold has lived at least one year. If we catch him again next year, he will have lived at least two years. So this way we're able to determine how birds survive in different environments. So maybe in some environments, it's hard for birds like Harold to survive. Whereas uh, in this one, we know he did pretty well at least in the last year. Awesome. Okay, we will let you get another bird ready for us. And while we do that, we are going to launch some more polling. Um, so the poll is, why might a bird have a much shorter wings than other birds of the same species? So thinking about those measurements that Brian is taking, this poll is taking a minute to launch as well. But why are birds different? The answers or the choices are, there we go. It doesn't take enough bird baths. Would that give it shorter wings? It eats too many berries. It didn't fly enough when it was young. Or maybe it may not have had enough bugs in its habitat when it was a nestling or a baby bird. So what do we think? I see a lot of different answers coming in. So we got some for bird baths, too many berries. I personally love berries. I know birds do too, uh, but they also love bugs. It didn't fly enough when it was young and it may not have had enough bugs when it was a nestling. Are the two top ones. Great, we still have some answers coming in. And we are gonna find out this answer as we go along with this next bird. So let's end this poll and then let's guess what our next bird will be. Okay, so I'll share the results with you of this one. Most of us say that maybe it didn't have enough bugs in its habitat when it was a nestling 
or maybe it didn't fly enough. Okay, so we're gonna find out when Brian has the next bird ready and let's vote which bird do we want? We're gonna relaunch that poll. Do we want a cardinal, house wren, blue jay, catbird, flamingo? Facebook, you can write it in the chat. We'll see it there. There's white-throated sparrow, chickadee, warbler, or bald eagle. Do they have to wait on this one? Mm -hmm. All right, I think Brian's almost ready. So we'll get our last guesses in. Okay, we've got a lot of votes for everything. So <laughs> People are really interested in anything we have. So we'll end this poll. All right, Brian, let's see. What do we have? All right. Well, we'll find out right after okay. we weigh it. So I'm just wrapping the bag really gently so it doesn't flap around. This is a much larger bird than the last one. The bird in the bag weighs 50 grams. 50 grams. So how many nickels is that, Caden? Oh, I missed. I wasn't listening. You said 50? 50 grams is the bird in the bag. Oh, when that's a great question. Said, a nickel was five grams, right? Yeah. So let's put it in the chat. What does everyone think? Oh, I can pull too. 50. How many nickels is that? Oh, we've got a lot of votes for 10. What else? Oh. Yep, so many people are saying 10 nickels. They got it. Yeah. Good job, everybody. So 10 nickels was the bird in the bag. And the bag weighs 17 grams. So a little over five, three nickels. Okay. So. so let's see if we have a close one. We said 50 minus 17. What is our closest answer? Yeah, good math, everyone. People are guessing around 34 grams and it is 33. You got it. Good job. Awesome. Everybody. So this bird weighs 33 grams. So 33 grams is a little less than seven nickels. Holy cow, this is a big bird. It's still really light because of those hollow bones. That weight can actually tell us a lot about a bird. So birds actually weigh different amounts through the year. It's breeding season right now. So during breeding season, a lot of the food that this bird eats is actually going to go into its young. So it will be lighter this time of year than it might be in the winter when it just sort of has to hang around eating food. Let's take a look at this bird for a moment. This bird has a black cap you can't really see the brown on the eyes super well, but it's got these like beautiful, deep, deep brown eyes. And it's got gray feathers all around. If we were to hear this bird sing, this bird makes a funny little meow as part of its song. A little meow that it does. And it's a mimic. It mimics the song, songs of all the birds and different sounds around it. If it lived in my yard year round, it might mimic the sound of car horns, but it makes all these amazing songs together as it's, as it's mimic. And this bird is also a migratory bird. These gray cat birds, they just moved into my yard about two weeks ago and they spend the winter in Cuba and Florida and points south of that. If you're in the Western United States, they might go to Mexico and even into uh, Central America to spend their winters. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Lauren guessed that was a catboard, so good job. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get a band out and add a band. When while you're banding them, how do you know what colors to put on? Is it just random or how do you choose? Oh, so I use a special uh, combination of colors. I'll show you mine right here. I use a special combination of colors. Each bird has its own combination. And we know that these combinations of colors 
are birds that we've never, uh, combinations that we've never added to another bird. So with these combinations, we can determine exactly the right colors to put on our gray cat bird. Um, our gray cat bird is a guy. And as a guy, I think I'll call him Gary. All so right. our gray cat bird is Gary. And I'm going to add aluminum band to Gary first. And while you're doing that, we had, oh, who was it? Uh, Mary asked, is there a limit to how many bands you put on each bird? We put three colors on each bird. And that's sort of our limit. Um, three colors on each bird and, and one aluminum band. So Gary looks like on his right leg is going to get an aluminum band. So let's look at my banding pliers really quick. So my banding pliers are a really special set of pliers. They've got these holes in it. And these holes are specially decised to fit the aluminum bands that I add to the legs. And now I'm going to have to look really closely. And I put the plier around Gary's leg. And I attach the band. There we go. There's Gary's band. And I read the band number. Very cool. So his band number is 2731. And I'm going to write all this down because taking notes is really, really, really important. 2731, 36441, 36441. And up on the screen is actually a close up of a, a different cat bird with some bands on it. So we can see what it looks like a little bit closer. Oh, cool. Great. So now we're going to add some color bands, just like that cat bird in the picture. Uh, could I get pink first? And those uh, little things that his helper scientists are helping him with, that's a spoon, right? Are you using to put on there? It's a color banding spoon. It's got a special channel on it. And you can, as I slide the color band up and down the channel of the spoon, you can see it's got a little opening. And I can just put that opening around the bird's leg and plop, get the color band, the bracelet for our cat bird right on the bird. And we see pink is closest to the bird's body. So on its left leg, it's got aluminum. Uh, pink over aluminum. Now let's move over to the right leg of the bird. And sorry, yeah. Uh, While you're putting those on, I know I've seen some around the zoo that maybe you even banded before. What should we do if we see a bird with these bands on them? Can we tell anyone or? There's a website. That's the Bird Banding Laboratory. Mm. And if you go to that website, you can write them at the, the scientist there a letter, an email, and they will report the banded bird to us. And then we can use those reports that just people all out there send in to determine who the bird is. And we've reused these reports to find birds that we banded even 10 or 12 years ago. We didn't even know they lived that long, but people helped us determine uh, when they lived and, or, or how long they lived and where they were banded. That's awesome. So yeah, that's why we like to catch them and study them because we're learning all kinds of things, even how long a bird lives in the wild. That's really yeah. cool. Uh, we mentioned before, and we've got some people asking, like Emma wants to know maybe if there a bird that's declining the most, um, or what kind of birds in our area, how can we help them? Like, what are their predators? What, what can we do for them? There's a lot of predators that really negatively impact birds, but none is more dangerous than the outdoor cat. The outdoor cat kills an estimated over billion birds every single year. We really need to make sure that if we have cats, if we have house cats, we keep them inside or give them a nice catio to sort of fenced area to play with when they're outside, because they're one of the real top dangers that we cause to birds. But there's a lot of steps that we can take, and maybe we'll go through each of those steps after I release 
Gary back out into the environment. Yeah, that sounds great. So now we're gonna make sure to do some of those measurements like we did for yeah. the last bird. So I'm just turning Gary around so I can get at the wing. Here's this nice wing. It's got long wings. And it's wing. Gary's wing weighs 90 or is 91 millimeters long. And songbirds like Gary grow their wings while they're in the nest. That skeleton is as big as it's gonna get before it leaves the nest. It's about two weeks from when it hatches from an egg until it flies away in a process that we call fledging. In those two weeks, Gary's gotta eat a lot of food. And the food that's gonna help Gary grow his wings as big as possible is bugs. It's invertebrates, it's worms, things like that. Spiders maybe, cicadas right now. Uh, so if Gary gets a lot of insects in his diet, or if he got a lot of insects in his diet, he could grow really long wings. If he doesn't, his wings are gonna be sort of short. And one thing that we know that we got that question, I believe from Mary, about how long uh, or, or what we can do to help birds. One of the things that we can do to help birds is actually plant things that, bird, that insects like to eat. If we support our insect community, that insect community can then support a healthy bird community. That's so, great. So we had that poll while you were getting this bird ready about why a bird's wing might be shorter. And most people did guess that it was because they didn't have enough insects when they were young. So good job, everybody. Awesome. Uh, Noah is wondering about cicadas. Do birds eat cicadas? They do. And oh, it's pretty they're gonna fun. have a feast. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I've been watching the cat birds in my yard for the last few days eating cicadas. Right now, the cicadas are still in their holes, but Cat birds like this one have been prying into the holes, grabbing the cicada out and munching it down. It's been really, really fun to watch. Oh, that would be. I'm definitely gonna have to go watch that. Yeah. So I'm checking uh, Gary's fat. He doesn't have much fat, but he just migrated here. So remember fat is a rechargeable battery the more food Gary had in his environment in the winter, the more fat he was able to bring on migration. And fat is what powered Gary through migration. He was probably good in fat because he got here early, stood up in a bush that's behind me and started singing pretty much right away. So he is a healthy, healthy cat bird. Now I'm gonna feel his keel. Oh, he's got a nice, nice keel muscle. I can feel how strong his breast muscles are. So that means that he was really able to fly here super well. I'm taking notes, recording everything that I observe. And with that, Gary can go back to sitting in the bush and occasionally hunting cicadas in the yard. Perfect. All right. Well, Brian gets ready to release Gary. Gabriel had a good question. So invertebrates are animals that live underwater, right? Well, invertebrates are animals without backbone. So if you feel up and down your back, you can feel your spine. Invertebrates do not have that. So those are different insects or bugs. Some of them can be in the water, but some of them are just flying around. So like cicadas and ladybugs and beetles. Good. All right, we're gonna send Gary back into the yard. Everybody say goodbye to Gary. Maybe type it in the chat. He can read it later. Yeah. Okay. Bye, Here we Gary. Go. Five. Four, three, two, one. Bye, Gary. Oh, perfect. All right. We have a lot of questions. So when Brian sits down, we're going to start to go through some of the questions that you've submitted in the Q&A. So if you have some that you've thought of, um, feel free to pop them in the Q&A now. And either Mary or Brian or Alexander or uh, Amy will help answer those. Are you ready for some of our questions? Sure, I'd love to. Okay, so Carlene wants to know if the length of the wing determines the distance the birds can fly. So if it has shorter wings, does it have to fly shorter distances? Not necessarily, Carlene. So 
oftentimes the shape of the bird's wings can be a real determinant of its ability to migrate. But some of our migrants are incredibly small with really, really tiny wings. So one of my favorites is the ruby-throated hummingbird that is actually in my yard right now. The ruby-throated hummingbird comes from way south. It'll, it'll live in Cuba and beyond. And it actually will fly across vast stretches of oceans with wings that are just this big. So it's not necessarily the size of the wing, but the shape of the wing that can allow for long migration. Awesome. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Lily and Levi, I think they were from Hungary when they joined us. So welcome. Wow. Um, thinking about our colored bands, what do you do? You ever run out of color combinations or what would you do if that happened? We have about, uh, I, I believe, about 2,500 different color combinations for each species. And we use those color combinations only in a certain area. So if we go to a new area, we can use that, that set of color combinations again, as long as it's really far away, maybe 100 kilometers or more away. Uh, but when, when we do run out, after maybe three or four or five years, we'd say, okay, we can use that color again because it's not likely we're gonna observe that bird again in the future. Yeah, that makes sense because they don't live as long as us. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, Amanda, oh, maybe that's when you gonna come in. Emma wants to know what bird is declining the most? Is there something we should really be concerned about helping like the bald eagle used to be declining a lot? That's a, that's a tough question. Um, there, there are several in, in serious decline. And, and I believe that uh, what we can do and the, the species that we can, we maybe should focus on are, are species that we can take important steps to help assist that decline. Uh, uh, one of the birds that I've recently been studying is a bird called the rusty blackbird. And we know that that population has declined over 90% in the last 20 years. We really want to make sure that we can take steps to help protect the rusty blackbird. And what we think we can do for those birds is uh, support healthy wetland habitats, especially really shallow wetland habitats. But there's other birds that, are, that have been in really serious decline, some that we've helped out of that decline, like Kirtland's warblers. Research that uh, the Migratory Bird Center has done has helped that bird uh, keep away from decline by finding out the habitats that help support those populations and determining how to best manage those habitats. Oh, that's great. So yeah, what is a habitat for those that might not know? For the Kirtland warbler? For any uh, Yeah, in general. Yeah, a habitat is, is really just where a individual or bird lives. And that habitat has a set of features to it. Some of those features might help support a healthy bird population, like native plants that have lots of insects that like to eat them, help support a healthy bird population. And some of the features of the habitats might be harmful, even though the birds live there. For example, outdoor cats might make the habitat more dangerous for them. Awesome. Okay. Emma would like to know, this is a very hard question, I am sure. What is your okay. favorite bird? Oh, that's a, that is a really hard question. Yeah, it's usually the hardest. It's changed year to year. Um, for a while, it's the Blackburnian warbler. If you guys look up the Blackburnian warbler, holy cow, they're a beautiful bird. Just amazing to look at. I have at. never heard of it. <laughs> oh, it, it's, it's wild. But right now, my favorite bird is actually one of our resident birds who lives here year round. And that bird is the white-breasted nuthatch. White-breasted nuthatch are just super fun to watch because you can watch them climbing up and down tree limbs, just this little bird. They grab seeds from my bird feeder and they walk it over to a tree and they hide those seeds in the tree so no other species can find it. And so they can find it in the future and eat it. It's called caching and they're just fun to watch. I, I would say they're cute. They are cute birds. That is great. All right, and then we've, we have so many questions and a lot of people wanna know, what can we do to help birds? So we've mentioned that their habitats might be in decline, um, keeping cats inside, but what other things are dangerous for birds and what can we help with? Is it good to feed them? Like you said, you had a bird feeder. 
Yeah, it can be good to feed them. Uh, it's especially uh, probably better to feed them uh, in the winter or the non-breeding season. During the breeding season, they really want to be bringing insects to their young. If you do feed birds, it's really, really important to keep your bird feeder as clean as possible. You want to make sure that you clean your bird feeder at least every other week because bird feeders can actually spread disease if you don't do that. Um, other important things, so the summertime is hot. And what do we like to do when it's really hot out? Or what do we need to do when it's really hot out? I like to go swimming. Yeah, I like to go <laughs> swimming too. And I like to drink a lot of water because yeah. if you drink water, you can actually make sure you're hydrating and you're safe. And birds need the same thing. But just like you probably wouldn't go to your nearby creek or river and drink water out of that, you should make sure that birds have a healthy water source to drink. And that can mean putting out a bird feeder that you're, sorry, a bird bath that you keep clean, or you could put out a plate of water. Just each day, just pour some water in a plate and put it out in your yard. You'll watch the, watch the birds not just drinking the water, but you'll watch them actually playing in it and bathing in it. It's really fun. Water is such an important thing for us to provide to wild animals, especially here in urban environments. That's great. And we have a poll we'll put up at the very end. I know we're coming up just a couple minutes before we are done. So if some of you have to jump off and go to class, that is fine. We will post a recording with this later so you can always finish it up. Um, but I do want to ask a couple more questions. Great. And one, Brian, is uh, I would like to go out and find some birds. Do I need to bring any tools? How can I safely, you know, start to become a bird or? Awesome. So really, I, I guess to add on to that question of, of what's, what's something that we can do for birds, probably the most important thing we can do for birds is to watch them. If we watch birds, if we see what they're using in their environment, we really get a close personal experience with those birds that allow us to know what they might need to better survive and what might be a danger for them. So for me, the first thing that I like to do is to keep a sheet of paper or a notebook handy and I'll watch birds in my yard. I'll watch how they're moving. I don't even need any extra equipment other than a pencil and piece of paper. I might describe what the bird looks like so I can look up who that bird is in the future So I, if I don't know it. But I'll write all these notes, you know, maybe, maybe uh, it is hunting off a tree or, or pulling insects off of the leaves of, of a tree or a plant. All those bits of information, all those observations are crucial. The next thing we can do is actually observe a bird through binoculars. If we have access to a set of binoculars, it's great to get that close hand look. And if you have a computer or a cell phone where you can record information, there's a website out there called eBird. eBird is awesome. It's a really neat place where you can submit observations that you see of birds, record your observations over time, and also look at the observations of others to see which birds might be in your neighborhood and, and which birds might be in your neighborhood part of the year, the migrants, and those that are here all year round. It's, it's really fun to watch birds, though, and it's a really important thing to do. Whether you have binoculars or don't have binoculars, it's really fulfilling. That's great. Yeah, I have my binoculars right back here by my window and then I use them anytime I see a bird just sitting out there that my cat is watching from in safely from inside and I usually take those binoculars out and look. That's yeah, great. if you let your cat out, it would eat those birds. Yep, she is no indoor only. Yep. Your cat will try to convince you that it likes the birds and would like to befriend <laughs> each of them, but it's not true. Your cat is not being honest with you. That she just wants to play. Yeah, she just wants to play. Um, okay, last question for you. We have a lot of students watching, even some adults that may want to change careers or go into bird banding. How can someone become a bird scientist? Do you have anything you'd recommend? Awesome. Well, I, I think, again, it starts by making those observations. And, and as you collect these observations of the natural world, you collect your own toolkit. And then if you use that excitement to propel you potentially to work or volunteer at a local nature center, 
Volunteering is an important step. Bird banding takes a lot of work to learn how to do, but there's lots of programs around the country where you could volunteer. It starts, you'll probably just take notes for a bird bander or hand them bands or something like that. That's the start of the whole process, taking notes and watching how scientists handle birds. And then of course, you gotta go to college. And, and going to college will potentially unlock doors that allow you to, to pursue ornithology as your profession. Awesome, yeah. And we're all learning from each other all of the time. So Brian learns from fellow scientists that study birds and he teaches others as well, just like we learned from him today. And I was a very slow learner. <laughs> you work hard. Slow. Sometimes that's what it takes. Me too. Got to work yeah. hard. Cool. All right. I'm going to la launch one last poll for all of our guests. It is thinking right now and it is going to say, what will you do to help birds where you live? So Brian mentioned a lot of different things and some we didn't mention, but these are all wonderful things you can do to help birds. So think about what can you do? Are you gonna plant native plants so that the birds have more um, insects to eat when they're young, so they have those big wings? Recycle, so making sure that we are doing our part to help the environment and their habitats. Feed birds in the winter, provide clean bird feeders or a clean, fresh water for them to drink and splash around in. Uh, clean up your neighborhood, this is what it's supposed to say, neighborhood. So that way you actually have fresh, clean habitat and water for them. Reducing lawn mowing. This is my favorite. And if anyone wants an excuse to not mow their lawn very much, Brian says to wait 10 days before you mow it, because that's going to let the grass grow and the insects give a chance to have their habitat so that this gives great food for birds keeping cat indoors, and then applying decals to windows. So a lot of birds, they see the reflection of trees and things outside in the windows and they don't know it's a window. So putting decals on the windows can really help them know they don't wanna run into that window. Mm. Good, okay. And there is our shared results. So we've got everyone saying they are gonna do everything pretty much. That is great. Awesome. awesome. All right. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Brian, thanks for taking us in your backyard and showing us the birds that you uh, were able to catch today and teaching us all about them. Maybe next time we do it again, we're going to catch some of those same birds we banded, or even those of us that live in the area or where they migrate might even see some of these birds. Will you remind us if we see them where we can go to put that in? That yeah, it's, it's the Bird Banding Laboratory. It's by USGS out of Patuxent, Maryland, the Bird Banding Laboratory. Okay, so everyone can look for that if we ever see some of our banded birds so we can help science, be citizen scientists. All right, thank you so much, Brian. Everyone wave, say thank you. Awesome. And before I let everyone go, thank you all for joining. I'm so glad that you were all able to be here with Brian and I today. Uh, we would love your feedback on this webinar so we know how to best do it in the future, what improvements we can make, um, what you loved. I, some people love my plants. Thank you, I love my plants too. Uh, and we have a short survey. When this uh, Zoom webinar closes, you will see the survey pop up or it will be in the chat as well as the Facebook chat. So please help us out, fill it out, let us know what you thought. If you're interested in watching this webinar again or want the ASL interpretation of it, it will be posted on our website in the future so you can watch for it there. But thank you again for joining us, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for our feathery friends. And then finally, if anyone would like more bird fun for this migratory or world migratory bird day, which is coming up on Saturday, we have one more webinar, which will take place on Friday. It is Friday, May 7th at 1 p.m. Eastern called the Wild Side of Steam, where we're going to meet an ecologist, Ruth Bennett, and we're going to hear about her career and even more about how we can get into birding or becoming a scientist, an uh, ecologist like she is. Awesome. Thank you for joining everyone. I hope you have a wonderful day. Remember, birding is for everyone. So get out there, just use your eyes, use your ears, see what birds you can hear and see and have a good time. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.